CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. March Madness is upon us, and it will begin Thursday in Buffalo with four games, and then two more on Saturday. I guess I'll just preface uh, this podcast with giving the rundown right now. Uh, because we're going to be talking about these eight teams. Uh, the first pod is number four seed Arkansas versus number 13 Vermont and number five UConn versus number 12 New Mexico State. Those winners will play on Saturday. And then number four Providence versus number 13 South Dakota State and number five Iowa versus number 12 Richmond the winners of those games will play on Saturday. Um, Jonah, what was your thought on the draw uh, on the teams that are coming to Buffalo? Well, there were some schools that I and, and other locals were hopeful for with local connections or, you know, everybody, not everybody, but there's a lot of fans of a school like North Carolina or Duke or Michigan or certain name brand teams. And I don't know if we really got too many of those. Some of that was a function of, the strength in the Northeast and not having teams like Duke or North Carolina, they're playing, well, North Carolina is not that high of a seat, but Duke and Gonzaga and the best teams in the country are not playing, are playing close to home. They're not going to come to Buffalo. And then with, but the Buffalo team, I think some people were rooting maybe to see Alabama with Nate Oates and, and the local connection on that team. Michigan had a local player. Um, Duke being the biggest story of the tournament because of Mike Krzyzewski, they were involved prominently in the advertising you'd see at Sabres games and things like that. You don't see the blue blood names or big name coaches that maybe have come to Buffalo in the past, but there are some good teams and some intriguing matchups and some interesting storylines and hopefully good games, because what you're going to see with five, 12 and four, 13 games, those are the games that traditionally you might see an upset or at least potential upset competitive games. And then they're going to lead to hopefully really good games on Saturday between four and five seeds playing each other and, and, Sometimes when you have good teams, you get blowouts and don't always get good games. And having maybe let the, not the teams that are top seed national title contenders will lead to more entertaining basketball here in Buffalo. Yeah, I'm actually looking for the story here. Um, I could have swore I saw a story posted on social media earlier today from the Buffalo News about how uh, the games have not sold out. But I'm here on uh, Buffalo News website yeah, well, I, and I can't I find that story. Sales. Ticket sales had been slow throughout the season for various reasons, maybe something to do with uh, obviously probably had something to do with the coronavirus and sales being down across the board for live sporting events and people not being able to come in over the border or not knowing if they would be able to come in over the border when tickets went for sale before. I don't know how many people sensed that we weren't going to see Duke or Syracuse or Michigan or Kansas or teams like that because it's really unpredictable or it's hard to predict when that's going to happen, except when Syracuse is good, you can all often count on them being sent to Buffalo. But, you know, attendance being down at the Sabres games, that's where I saw most of the advertising for this. And that building's been half full on a good night. So I don't know. People know that these games are coming to Buffalo, but I didn't feel as much buzz coming into these games as there has been in the past. I think that just has something to do with the times we were in and the climate. Because I do think eventually you'll see a pretty full building, whether it's local fans or fans of the teams that were sent here. People find a way to get tickets and get into the gyms and the buildings, especially that second day. Um, so when some tickets go on the secondary market. But I got an email from the Buffalo News promoting 
tickets still being for sale. And in the first couple of times the tournament came here, the first year in 2000, you had to enter a lottery to get tickets. And a few of the times after that, it was a hot ticket to get. I think maybe that newness is worn off and not every basketball fan feels like they have to be there. But you always find, I think people that don't have tickets now find their way into getting tickets and getting into these games by the time they tip off. I wonder if there will be some fans coming up from the Southern tier, basketball fans, you know, St. Bonaventure alums who maybe were holding out hope that their team was going to get into the tournament and they'd be traveling to go watch St. Bonaventure play in the first round. But now the games here in Western New York, they'll, they'll end up showing, uh, uh, they'll end up coming on Thursday or, or Saturday. Um, Bonnet is playing that NIT game in Colorado. And right. I know Bonnie's fans are, you know, they travel as well as anybody in the country. I'll be curious to see how many are really <laughs> going to go to Colorado for that game, though. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to be out in Boulder uh, to go watch an NIT game. Uh, I think that if it were reversed and Colorado were coming to the Riley Center, that the place would be packed. So it's not the fact that it's the NIT, but the combination of the NIT out in the mountain time zone uh, traveling during spring break when when airfares and things like that are, are high. Um, not to say that Boulder is a spring break destination, but all the flights are, are jacked up. Um, That's why I, it would have been, I think, good if there was a kind of a main event level draw whether it's a big blue blood team that everybody wants to see in years past buffalo's gotten number one seeds and you kind of felt like you saw a great team on its way to the final four a national champion worthy team you're not going to see that this year and there's certain locals either players or coaches john beeline's not coaching anymore but he never got sent here with michigan that always would have been kind of a cool local event i think that could have happened with nate oates in alabama this year but the draw didn't go that way I would like to think that UConn, Iowa, and Providence would travel well. Those are basketball schools, and uh, the tournament is what uh, those fan bases live for. Arkansas, more of a, well, I don't know. I don't even know if to say that that's more of a football school. I, Arkansas is a, has a deep basketball history, and uh, Musselman is their head coach, you know, probably the most, uh, the biggest name of the coaches. You know what? Musselman, Buffalo, did you see his tweet today? I didn't. He's got a bit of a viral tweet going out where he, at a practice, this looks like it all happened at one practice. He wore a Buffalo Braves shirt, a Buffalo, two different Buffalo Bills shirts, and a Buffalo Sabres t-shirt. So he's either a huge Buffalo fan. He says he has some connections to the San Diego Clippers and Ernie DiGuggerio and maybe has always been a Braves fan. But I don't know if he's also a Bills and a Sabres fan or if he's really trying to get the local fans on the side of his team this weekend. That's pretty savvy, actually. If if he doesn't really have an endearing or an endeared uh, connection to Buffalo and he's just uh, he's uh, ginning up the the fan base to say all right we like this Musselman guy he loves Buffalo so all the neutral local fans are going to be uh, Arkansas uh, fans for Buffalo the, for the has become a an easy and kind of a hip team to get behind but not really be behind them kind of a, a bandwagon jump on oh yeah I love this team that goes crazy and jumps through the tables and I don't know if this applies to the Sabres as well, but I feel like there's a little bit of that too. I don't know why. There is some sexiness missing from this field, and there's always been something about the field uh, when it's in Buffalo. Sometimes it's the players. Sometimes it's just coaches. I'm thinking about the first time that it was here, and you had uh, Bobby Knight and Don Chaney and Jan Van Bredekoff at Pepperdine. You had Eddie Sutton. Um you know, of course, there have been the recent years with Bayheim and, you know, they're Shashevsky, but you don't really have it. I guess Musselman is is the biggest coach out of the group, right? I mean, is there even any? Well, Danny Hurley is kind of on the rise. It yeah. has a famous name and, and UConn is a program that is being resurrected, although they've, they've been good recently and then kind of had a swoon. But UConn's been here twice before, 2004 and 2014 and went on to win the national championship later that year. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen with this team, but Danny Hurley, who played here in an NIT game against Canisius when he was at Seton Hall, and Bobby Hurley's brother, there's a loose Buffalo connection there, and he, when he was the coach of Rhode Island, coached against St. Bonaventure for many years. But he's not a Hall of Fame name coach, at least at this point in his career, like you know, some of the people that have been here in years past. Jay Wright. Villanova was here last year right. after being the national champion and being a number one seed again. Mike Bray and Notre Dame bringing uh, Chris Christie in attendance. You know, there's yeah, yeah, 
there's been some uh there's been some cachet there's some there, i don't so there's not sexiness like when you're trying to sell the event with these coaches and because I, I was talking to John Waro and all he could talk about was the coaches. And I was thinking, I don't know if the people going to the games care about the coaches as much as we do. But when we're going to the press conferences, the coaches are kind of everything when we're trying to build up and write stories about these games in a way. But there are some players and, and you know, Keegan Murray from Iowa is one of the best players in the country. He's a national player of the year candidate and probably going to be an NBA lottery pick. And I'm trying to think of good players that have played here. There have been a lot of them. Jameer Nelson was on the St. Joe's team. But I don't know if there have been too many surefire player of the year, lottery pick talents coming through in these tournaments. Stephen Curry played here as a freshman the year before he really got onto the national scene. He's maybe one of the best players that I think I remember seeing play here in Buffalo. You can't forget Speedy Claxton. Um, Steve, Steve, Speedy Claxton was an excellent player and played in the NBA, but I don't know. And maybe this Keegan Murray's not on that level, but I don't, Speedy Claxton wasn't a guy where you were like, man, I can't believe I got to see Speedy Claxton play. Live. Right. Wow. Shaheen maybe Holloway. Shaheen Holloway, though, is, is famous for making, not famous, but known in Buffalo basketball history for making that full court layup. Now he's the coach at St. Peter's. They made it to the NCAA tournament, and he's kind of a hot name to be somebody else's coach eventually. I was hoping no. they'd get set here, but they were seated too low. Um, I'll ask you about the upset. You know, who, who is the, the best chance to score an upset in the first round? But let me ask you this. If you were to have a tournament with all eight of these teams and that they played each other all the way through, what team would come out on top? In other words, what's the best team in this, uh, in this uh, group of eight? Uh, probably Arkansas. Um, Providence, I think, is a good team that's had a good year. They've had their best year wins wise since Rick Patino was the coach and Billy Donovan was the point guard. And this is the highest they've ever been seated in the tournament. But they got beat pretty bad in the Big East tournament. They haven't finished the season great. Some people think they shouldn't have been seated as high as they were as a fourth seed in Iowa. Um, they're a good team from the Big Ten. I mean, it's kind of hard to, you know, I don't know. I don't watch these teams closely enough there's probably other people to answer who's really better than them but I would say that just league wise and who's done what this year in their conference I'd probably go with Arkansas and an NBA coach for the record here are the national ratings these aren't the seeds but these are the national ratings uh the AP top 25 for the the top schools here coming to Buffalo um Providence is 13 Iowa is 16 UConn is 21. I'm missing somebody. Where's Arkansas? Arkansas is 17. Okay, so let me give them to you in order again. 13 Providence, 16 Iowa, 17 Arkansas, 21 UConn. Um, let me just give you another set of numbers. The Ken Palm yeah. ratings, which I, I think are pretty, especially as the season goes along. They get smarter with more games, and by the end of the year, they're pretty good at telling you who's good and who's not good. Iowa, 13. UConn, 18. Arkansas 20, and I got to keep scrolling, scrolling and scrolling, looking for Providence. Where is Providence? You might, we might have to take a commercial break. You might have to read an ad for <laughs> 49, 49. I scrolled up and down a couple times there. But, you know, considerably lower than the other four and five seeds that are being sent here. And that doesn't mean that Providence is not a good team. They've had a good year. They have, you know, they've been – a winning team and into the tournament a few times over the past few years, but they just don't seem like quite a powerful four seed as much as some of the other teams might be more deserving of their seed number. So if you had to pick an upset out of these uh, four games that we're going to see on Thursday, uh, what's uh, what do you like? Well, in that regard, usually when I fill out a bracket and I pick upsets, I pick, I'm looking for, big conference teams I think can lose as much as the other teams. I mean, sometimes you can really see a hot team from a mid-major or a low conference that you think is going to make a run and it's easy to pick those upsets. But a lot of times it's picking the team that you saw was struggling down the stretch and might have got into the tournament because they had good power rates from non-conference play but isn't playing their best basketball and is beatable because those seem to be the teams that struggle against you know, they think they're better than a team from a smaller league and then they get on the neutral floor and they don't realize that 
uh, you know, what the competition level might be. And San Diego State, South Dakota State, sorry, who plays that first game, that early game against Providence, they're the second highest scoring team in the country. They're the lead the country in three point field goal percentage. I think I saw they have the best three point shooting percentage in 28 years since an Indiana team in 1994. And the game's changed so much, the lines have gotten deeper now. It's harder to have a really high three point percentage if you're shooting more and more threes like teams do. So a team shooting 45% from three is pretty wild. And they also shoot, I, I think they saw their 10th in the country in two point shooting. Douglas Wilson, uh, you know, he's averaging 17 points. I think he's been over 20 in the last three or four games. He's one of the most efficient two-point shooters in the country. So they're a really good offensive team. And that seems like the recipe for an upset to me, a team from a mid-major league that shoots the ball really well, scores well, and is going to be in the game against a power conference team that might not be playing, peaking at the right time. Poor Mike Rodak, if his Providence Friars uh, can't get out of the first round. Well, yeah, I, and I don't want to, because I think there's good elements to the Providence story, and they might have some local fans here, and Ed Cooley coached at Fairfield, a former Mac coach. I'm kind of, you know, if you're rooting for a story, a story I'm rooting for is maybe Providence wins and Iowa wins, and you have two former Mac coaches that coached against each other in the Mac. Now, coaching other teams or coaching against each other in the NCAA tournament. I don't believe that's ever happened before. There have been a number of coaches that have come through the MAC and been high major coaches have gone to the NCAA tournament with other teams, but I don't think two of them have ever met up on the same NCAA tournament floor before. So you know, yeah, I win either way. Cool. We get a good story out of that game. Fran McCaffrey, by the way, uh, former Fran Siena McCaffrey. coach, now yeah, the yeah. Uh, head coach at uh, Iowa. Um. Real quick, Jonah, uh, the nickname of South Dakota State? Jackrabbits. All right. I just I figured that might like be Jack the one. I thought that might be the one that uh, I could sneak past you that, you that you might not know. I might not know all of them, but I know that one because uh, it's a memorable one. Do you know Vermont? Uh, are they? No, I don't. I, I thought you'd know it. Vermont because they've been in the tournament, you know, a handful of times. I, know, over the I, I past. should know this. And they've played against local teams. They've played UB. They're not the, the Vermont are they? Catamounts. Catamounts. I should have known that. Actually, I should have known that. Can How about New Mexico it? State? I know. The Lobos? No, no that's New Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. Why don't you quiz me on Section 6 nicknames? I know those New Mexico are State things. are the Aggies. Aggies. Yeah, well, good for them. Uh, I used to think Toledo was the Toledo Blades. I wrote that in a story or two before. That was the name of their hockey team, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe not uh, Not the Toledo Rockets. The Toledo Rockets did not make it. They were the favorites to get into the, the tournament uh, heading into the Mid-American Conference uh, um, tourney, and they blew it. So Akron gets to go. I guess, you know, Jonah, you, you're familiar with the Mid-American Conference, and I know that uh, – you know, it just seems kind of strange, right? Um, Akron? Uh, oh, no, well, no, Akron's been good. Um, I don't know if they've been to the tournament in a few years. They, Akron was really good with Keith Dambrot. And then right. And, Duquesne, and, and they a lot brought of, in John Grochi. And a lot of LeBron James funding and a lot of LeBron James's high school well, teammates back at that time. That's true. That's true. But they've been a good team. In the regular season, I think they were one of the better teams two years ago when they didn't finish the MAC tournament and nobody went to the NCAA tournament. They were the fourth seed. They were ahead of UB this year, and they beat UB in the quarterfinal, and that was a really good game. They weren't like ahead of the MAC record-wise like they had been under Keith Dambra, but they John Grochi was the coach of Ohio. He won it twice, then he went to Illinois, came back. He was the highest paid coach in the league, and he, he might be again after NATO was left. So I'm not surprised at Akron. I thought one of these years Akron was going to break through and win it. I did think, oh, did we talk about this? Did you see what happened? That Kent State, yeah, I watched the team game. got suspended, but they have to, or one guy got suspended for a game and other guys got suspended for a half for making a profane rap video the day before. Kent State had won 14 in a row and they might have won that game too, but they had to play half the game without half their lineup. I thought that was a pretty stiff penalty for using a couple of cuss words especially at a state school. I mean, it's not like this was uh, Brigham Young where you have to, you know, sign away, uh, you know, you have a code of ethics that you need yeah, to sign. It's but, uh, college basketball and they're all like 
23 years old in these leagues. It's not the parochial <laughs> league. Right. I mean, I don't know. Am I out of line here thinking that was a harsh punishment in the championship game? Putting Well, I'll be honest. I didn't the see the video. I don't know. Maybe, was there nudity in it? I don't know. Uh, maybe it was. It was a, a rap song. I think it was considered poor sportsmanship. It was the Mac that did this. Um, I don't know. I, I was pretty shocked when I saw that Kent State was going to, you know, have guys in the penalty box for half the game. Because, uh, you know, I don't even think that happens in high school. Like, if it's the playoffs, the Section 6 playoffs, they don't suspend a guy for being a jerk. Sometimes they do, but you got to do something pretty bad, I think. Your general thoughts on the tournament um, in regard to the the field of 68. Um, you any matchups or anything that really – But is there anything that stands out when you take a look uh, at the matchups or surprises? It doesn't seem like they're – all the number one seeds seem vulnerable to me this season. Um, a lot of – there's a lot of losses among the number one seeds. Right, yeah. Well, that's been the story with college basketball. Nobody's been able to stay as number one. Teams have gotten to number one and lost, and there hasn't been a great team that really separated themselves. But the teams I like are the number one seeds. I, I kind of do think Gonzaga's as good as they've ever been. And one of these years, they are going to win it. They, they've gotten to the final four a number of times in the final game twice in the past four tournaments. And I've thought they were the best team for most of the year or whenever I saw them. Uh, Arizona's really good. I think they could win it. They're a number one seed. Baylor won it last year, and it's not as good as they were last year. So Baylor has seemed to shaky to me. They really lost bad. their one conference game. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they're coming in on a right. loss. They had no tournament, no conference tournament wins, but they still got the first seed. Right, and Kansas is the other number one seed, and they're good, and they're usually good, and, and they could go to the Final Four. Um, Syracuse isn't in it, which some people might be sick of seeing Syracuse, but they always tend to make a run as a low seed, and they have some local appeal and all that media fandom. I feel like the tournament's better when they're in it and they're not Do you in think it. they could have gotten in if Buddy Bayheim didn't get suspended? They probably would have had to go a little bit further in the conference tournament. I they mean, almost beat Duke without him. Yeah, they almost beat Duke. And that would have given them, so they would have then been 500. They probably would have had to win, I think, another game. And I, I don't think they would have gotten in with a losing record and a 500 record, probably not. If they had gone all the way to the championship game, I thought they could win the tournament. They've done that plenty of times when they were out of the field and then they made a run. It's usually mostly happened in the Big East, but they, I thought they would beat Duke and go on and have this Cinderella bid stealing run. So I don't know. To, to get back to your point, Duke is the most, compelling story in the tournament i think because it's coach k and if they lose it's his last game or if they go all the way to the title game and win that's his last game it's his last tournament so whether they're winning or losing that's going to be interesting to watch they have excellent players paulo banchero is going to be a top three pick in the nba uh one no more they're, they're a good team but they're not like a far and away great duke team like we've seen before they're not favorite they're the number two seed in gonzaga's region so looking ahead that would be pretty interesting if those two teams play and Duke beat Gonzaga earlier in the year. I think they beat Gonzaga. Actually, I shouldn't say that without knowing that specifically. I think Gonzaga beat Duke, to be honest with you. Nope, Duke beat Gonzaga. No upset specials or anything? Have you had a chance to look at the, the bracket in, in any great depth? Any I haven't quite think looked is at maybe that. hot, I mean, but, but underseeded. I mean, Houston is a good team, and they're seeded fifth, and they could go to the Final Four. But I don't know if that's they're not that's not an upset in the first round, and I don't know how far you get in before they're pulling upsets. You know, I don't know. South Dakota State looks to me like should be a hot upset pick with their as good as they are. New Mexico State has won what twenty one in a row. Did I get that right, or did I get that wrong? Anyways, those are teams. You I'll look it up. Like. Keep talking. San Francisco is a 10 seed playing against Murray State, a seven seed, and that's not a big upset. But I think San Francisco's a good team that should have been in the top 25 earlier this season. I think they could maybe make a run there and make win that game and maybe make a run beyond that. But I haven't really studied the bracket for all my upset picks. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what the upsets are going to be. I tend to pick a lot of upsets in my pool because then you know, whatever happens, I say, Hey, I called that one. And you know, you don't got to worry about the other ones that you lost. So I 
tend to pick four good teams to go to the final four and then everybody else to get upset. And I look smart one way or the other. New Mexico state has won three in a row. Well, so I'm clearly thinking about a different team here. Maybe South Dakota state. Let me look this up. I've been focusing a little too much on Richmond because that's who I'm writing my next story about. So I'll be, you know, I scratched some of these things out on notes and I can hardly read my notes. Speaking Let's of take Richmond, a look at the South Dakota State Jackrabbits, winners of 30 games, 30 and four. I'm guessing that's the team you're thinking of. Let's take a look at their uh, game yeah, by game. Uh, haven't, haven't lost since December 15th against Missouri State. Their other losses were to Idaho, Washington, and a then number 14 Alabama in the second game. Uh, and then they have rattled off nothing but wins since then. So uh, nine and four. Yeah, they have won 21 in a row heading into their game against Providence Thursday at 1240 p.m. That's your tip. Sounds like an upset pick to me. But, you know, the brackets can be hard to pick. There's always a team that looks ripe for an upset, like they shouldn't have gotten in the tournament, and they end up going to the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight and kind of proving everybody wrong that they didn't belong. And there's oftentimes a team that looks like an obvious upset pick, like a low-seeded team that got seeded too low, and they're a good mid-major, and everybody says how great they are, and they come up flat. It, it, you know, in the single elimination format, you, know, you can pick winners, but it's kind of hard to pick. You know, there's a lot of randomness. It's not a real predictable event. That's kind of the appeal, the television appeal that comes with watching the tournament. Now, Providence has lost two of its last three. It lost uh, its regular season finale against number 11, Villanova. No fault there. They only lose by two points uh, at Villanova. Then they go into the tournament and uh, beat Butler by four points and then get crushed by 27 against Creighton. Um, so, again, just if you're looking at uh, trends, um, but really no bad losses for Providence, maybe other than that. Uh, they lost to Virginia early in the season. That's pre-Thanksgiving. A loss at Marquette. Well, they got beat by 28 there. That's a bad loss. Uh, but Marquette's a good team. And uh, only five losses uh, in total. So, but if you're looking for a team that's trending, uh, maybe, you know, obviously South Dakota State knows how to win. The, le the level of competition, not nearly as good as, as what uh, Providence faces in the Big East. But have proven to be beatable. Um, let's switch over to the women, Jonah, and um, a, a lot uh, of Western New York activity there. Un unfortunately for the men, uh, we don't have anything to track uh, other than St. Bonaventure going out to Colorado in the first round of the NIT, but uh, University at Buffalo women, um, Damon women, right? Um, C. What's, what's Give us the rundown there. Well, that was kind of the rundown, but well, I mean, the I, I games, was, the matchups, all that stuff. I would say overall that women's basketball is having a moment, not just this season, but over the last several seasons. And some of this is connected. Some of it's happening independent of each other. But as you mentioned, UB women in the NCAA tournament for the fourth time in seven years, they go play at Tennessee, one of the women's basketball blue blood programs. And that'll be on ABC at three o'clock on Saturday. So that's quite the television exposure for the women's basketball team and their story and how good that program has been over the last seven years. And with four trips, they've matched the men, you know, they've been just as in the aggregate, just as good as the UB men were in their tremendous run that they've had the Damon women. They were qualified for the tournament for the third year in a row. Last well, let's year, stay on UB enough. Tennessee. Let's stay on that for a little bit. Um, Obviously, it's, you know, Tennessee is a seeded number four, uh, perennially uh, number one seed for a long, long time. I mean, one of the, like you say, a blue, br a blue blood uh, program in women's college basketball, uh, legendary. Uh, they're going to, UB is going to be playing on Pat Summit Court. I mean, it, that's a heady thing, but Felicia Leggett Jack seems like the type of coach. She's such a motivator, such an inspirational speaker. She'll, she'll probably find a way to help mitigate some of that pressure or the, the, um, any, any overwhelming 
um, feeling that these these players may have to be playing in Knoxville uh, at Tennessee, where so much history has transpired? I think that could work in their favor. I think that'll be part of, as, as you mentioned, the motivation in that Buffalo will be up to play in that kind of, you know, not historic, but a that in that environment and on that national stage and, and feel like that the women's college basketball world, at least is watching them play that game. And that's their opportunity. And talent wise, I think this is as good of a UB team, if not the best team that they've had. Uh, Summer Hemphill is the only player I believe that's been on the NCAA tournament trips prior, but has a little bit of that experience and they've beaten teams, uh, you know, high major teams and they've, lost but played well against Connecticut and South Carolina and Georgia I think was the other team that they played when they had really good teams and were really uh, you know on their way to the final four and possibly winning the national championship they played against South Carolina in the Bahamas earlier this year Uh, the game wasn't very close but they're not going to be shell-shocked by how good the opponent is Uh, Tennessee might be too big and too strong uh, for a MAC opponent you know, that kind of thing It is a mid-major against a high major. But that aside, I think the Buffalo women won't be at all intimidated by it being Tennessee and a team from the SEC and not being able to compete in that game. You you mentioned um, that you think that all of this hoopla can work in their favor. How so? Is it because Felicia Leggett Jack is the type of coach who can put it in perspective for them? Well, or? well, I think she's maybe a good messenger for that. Yes. And I think that, and that was some of the talk at the selection show that she was going to educate the team on the history of Tennessee women's basketball and, and kind of make sure they know what that program means and what playing against that team means. And, you know, I don't know if they've tried to schedule a game against Tennessee before and haven't been able to, and it, you know, maybe there's some sort of element of actually being able to play in this gym and against this opponent and have that on your resume that matters to these girls and this team. But I also, I think it just comes down to playing against a big name in a showcase game. That's going to be on ABC. will get it. They probably rather play at home, but I think there's a bit of a, an energizing feeling that the UB women will get from playing this road game that they wouldn't get if this game was on a neutral floor or, you know, in Buffalo. And what's next for the Damon women? Well, Damon women are done, but they made a run. They they won. They were the number eight seed in an eight team eight team East Regional. They upset the number one seed, and then they beat the number four seed, and then they lost against the number seven seed. They would have they lost by a basket in a late game that they had the lead kind of late, um, and they would have gone to the NCAA quarterfinals for the second year in a row if they had won that game. But so two years in the NCAA round of sixteen. For a team that's only been Division Two, Division, yes, Division Two, six years now. And NCCC women, along with the NCCC men, opened up play at the Nationals tonight. The UVA women won something called the USCAA, which isn't quite the same level of competition, but it's a team that won. St. John Fisher, which is coached by a woman from Orchard Park, Melissa Graham was her name, Melissa Kuberka now with a lot of local players on the team. They went to the NCAA tournament. There's kind of more, it seems to be more local players going on to division one schools and high major division one schools. Amari DeBerry playing at Connecticut and they're in the tournament. Got Cheshesky going to Providence next year. No, Penn State, Penn State. And other division one caliber signees and players uh, niagara's having their best team that they've had in 17 years and built around local players from cardinal hera so there's a lot i i think some of this is connected i think the ub women ha- have set a good kind of interest level and excitement for younger players in the era some of it's kind of going on concurrently but at all levels of the sport and women's basketball seems to be at its height i don't know if it's ever been as good at the different levels of play here with women's basketball in Buffalo, at least as far as I can remember. Uh, I guess I, I wanted to ask you about this and I skipped uh, too quickly. Uh, UB getting a 13 seed. Um, I know that that's pretty common for the mid-American conference, but for such that they're a good team, 13 seems 
seems a bit high to me. Yeah, I thought it might be a 12, but you really got to break it down and see who are the other teams in the field and who they should have been seated ahead of. Um, you know, so I thought being the second best team in the MAC, regular season wise, and then winning the MAC in the MAC being generally a two bid lead, and they were a 10 seed when they got in as an at large a couple of years ago. I thought 12 was just where I'd pegged them in my head, but you, you know, you'd have to see where they rank in the net against other teams. And, and I don't know if there was much chatter there that they thought a 13 seed was too low. I think with the conference ratings and their rating, that seemed to be where they were projected. I believe that's where I think Akron's a 13. And I think any Mac team that won it on the men's side is probably getting seated around that line. All right. Jonah, any other uh, basketball thoughts? No, I just, you know, looking forward to the games. Hopefully people listening here are, if they're not going to the games, kind of looking forward to the games on television and their brackets. Sorry, I can't give more picks. I haven't really gotten into looking into that yet. Usually Mike McDonald likes to come on and give us his picks. Maybe we can squeeze them in a bonus episode or something. Yeah, maybe we can. What uh... about you? I'm more interested in your thoughts. You don't cover a lot of college basketball and you're, on the college basketball beat this weekend. Yeah, I'll be covering all the games. Um, I'll be there courtside. Uh, I'm looking forward to covering basketball. Uh, it's something that I don't get to do a lot of. Um, uh, the teams are okay. There are stories on every team. You just have to look a little harder for them. But um, there's just no – I keep using the word cachet on these te- – obviously, UConn is a, has the most history. Iowa being from the Big Ten. Um and Arkansas too, with with Musselman as the head coach, and um, you know Arkansas has had its glory time. But um, when when I saw the eight teams, there was just nothing that was obvious, uh, no pull for me, not a lot of a lot of gravitas. But you just have to look a little harder. And I do have stories that I'm going to be working on for all these teams. I don't want to give them away here. Uh, because uh, I don't want other people to to copy uh, my work, but uh, I'll. Right. Well, uh, and what you're doing, and what I'm doing, in kind of a different way, in a in different scale, is is difficult because Selection Sunday is Sunday night, and the games are Thursday, and there's not a lot of turnaround time to research and find these stories, and then half the teams are going to lose Thursday. Like if you knew who was playing Saturday, right, you could start doing these stories and report them on Wednesday and Thursday, and write them on Friday, but you don't know who's going to be out of the tournament by then. Yeah, you need to fire your bur- your bullets early uh, because you don't know. You can't keep anything in your holster, or else you've wasted uh, you wasted the ability to tell a good story. Um, I do have a story that involves one of the uh, higher seeds in here. I, ho- I hope that they win, just because I'm not going to have enough time to write it uh, by tomorrow. So um, I hope that they win, so that way I can tell it uh, Friday. So there's that. But yeah, that's it's. It's a weird position to be in and uh but it's fun too to have you know it's a bit of a whirlwind and we're going to learn so much about these eight teams and then three days later we're not going to need to remember any of it but at least while they're right. here we have to tell the stories and uh, so yeah it's, it's fun in that regard it adds some variety and you know for you know for covering a, a 20 week nfl season and have the ability to cover some hockey like I have and, and now some basketball. Um, but it's a pretty cool part of my job to be able to, to do other things rather than just uh, the one thing that I'm known for. Um, I guess I should mention before uh, we go, Jonah, that uh, Amherst Pizza and Ale House would be a perfect place for you to watch all the games this weekend. You can watch all of those, the pay-per-views, all the different sports, not just basketball. Uh, at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville, that's right off of Millersport Highway in the 990. Amherst Pizza and Ale House has TVs indoors, outdoors. The, the weather's supposed to get up into the 60s. So maybe you could want to go uh, get some fresh air, watch those afternoon games outside, uh, which would be uh, pretty sweet. Uh, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Uh, a lot of energy in there. As I always like to say, it's just a cool vibe and you can track all of your different wagers because they have so many TVs, all the different games will be on uh, and you can just uh, pivot your head a little bit and you'll be able to watch this game, that game, and the other game. Stop in or call for takeout and delivery 
716-625-7100. Once more, 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Uh, Jonah, thanks for your time and your thoughts on the hoops. Uh, we'll I come got back one last again. question. Oh, sure, sure. If, if you could uh, allow me. If there's a, let's say there's a big game-winning shot, buzzer beater, some big moment that happens at one of these basketball games Thursday or Saturday, do you think the building will get louder than it was booing Jack Eichel? No. Oh, wait. Well, yeah, because their crowd will be there. Yes, it will be louder. Uh, I think it will be much more energetic. And if you're into energy and that's something that we were talking about, it was the, the, it was the topic of my story after the Jack Eichel uh, return game last Thursday. Um, People who talk about how cool it was to be in that arena. Well, tickets are available to these basketball games. Uh, It doesn't get much better than that with the bands and the cheerleaders and the, just the general vibe in the arena when it comes to these uh, March madness games here in Buffalo, it's, and, and you want to go on Thursday because you have the hopes riding for these lower seated teams and a lot of the fans clear out for Saturday. So let's say, let's say Iowa gets beat um, by uh, Richmond on Thursday. Uh, all those Iowa fans leave and there's that many, I mean, maybe it's a good way to you know pick up some tickets if you want to hold off. But Thursday's the, those are the games to go to because of that's college basketball. That's the cool stuff. That's and the, the, the yeah, arena gets a the little, everybody, ignores their work and watches the computer or whatever that. And you can bet on these games too, if you're into that kind of thing with your phone there and you can bet and just, uh, you know, so that, that much more energy. I mean, you can have as, you know, as much octane as you want for these, uh, for these games. So make a video with swear words before the game or you'll get suspended. Well, you, as a fan, you can, but if you're playing, you shouldn't, I wouldn't risk it. (laughs) <laughs> Jonah, thanks for this. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening to Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.